industrial history of, of the Duwamish River based on the pollutants that have accumulated yeah. over time. So. Would you eat any fish out of here? No. <laughs> I prefer my salmon from Alaska. <laughs> One of the most critical considerations for the salmon in the Northwest would be freshwater habitat, and specifically the water quality in the rivers and lakes. been here for five years and a few years ago we had very little coho return and the ones that did come back were very small. They were jacks and micro jacks. That was a troubling year and we didn't know why we had so few coho. So it's about keeping that in mind and keeping those numbers in mind and raising what we can and balancing out the fishing and the fertilizing of the eggs. We started working with the Suquamish Indian tribe out um, at Grover's Creek at their hatchery there. And we would actually collect urban stormwater runoff, bring it out to the hatchery, and they, the tribe, would collect fish for us and we could do experiments with them. So one of the first things we learned that surprised us was that it didn't take very long at all of being exposed to this stormwater runoff for the coho to get sick and then die. And this is a pretty unusual phenomenon. You know, there aren't a lot of places in North America anymore where you'll just see fish dying very quickly in a matter of hours. We have endangered orcas, we have threatened salmon, uh, so if we can get these species delisted, get them off the endangered species list, meaning that they're fully recovered, that would be a big measure of success. There's two of you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you guys. Off you go. Go, go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Our ahead. crowd is very diverse uh, internationally and uh, some people are local from right down the street and some people travel here an hour away to come here to get fish. When those people show up with coolers and they're so happy to be here, it's fun for me. So we send them home with fish to smoke and cut and clean and it becomes kind of a uniting thing for families as well. There weren't any hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest. We would we would have just a fraction of the salmon available that we have now. If hatcheries weren't around, we would not have our traditional foods readily available for our ceremonies. And that would be very unfortunate. We have uh, not only weddings and funerals that are important to us to celebrate in our traditional way, but we have other ceremonies 
and gatherings that are important for us to have traditional foods at those. ceremonies are very special because it's our way of telling the salmon please come back please tell your relatives to come back here where we will honor you respect you and take care of you here in Carkeek Park in North Seattle and it's beautiful, right? And one of the things that we have paid a lot of attention to as a society in, in places like this in our cities is the physical habitat. We've done a pretty good job of trying to make sure that the physical habitat is pretty decent for species like salmon. However, we haven't paid enough attention to the chemical habitat. So those are two sides of what is habitat. And the chemical habitat's a little harder to control. It's not what you see with your eyes when you look at this environment. As a white European American, I recognize that we are newcomers to this land. We have a, a number of tribes that have been here for thousands of years and are the original stewards of this land. Uh, and then in 1974, it was affirmed that they have their treaty rights which were previously signed by the U.S. government, uh, were affirmed through something called the Bolt Decision. And they have a right to continue to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed grounds forever. And all of us have a, a responsibility to hold that in trust, and particularly uh, the government agencies have responsibility to hold that in trust. This fall we did pre-spawn mortality studies and basically the water that's coming off West Seattle is so polluted that the salmon die before they actually spawn. So we've been working with the uh, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife to continue to document that. Coho and other salmon as well certainly suffered as we develop our ecosystems for, on the one hand, just loss of habitat, but on the other hand, um, we've definitely seen, and particularly with coho salmon, that the chemicals that are carried by stormwater runoff are a problem for them. So for many years now, we've been tracking what happens to coho salmon in the fall when it's raining and there's stormwater runoff entering the creeks, just as the adults are coming back up those streams to try to spawn. And we found that uh, a lot of these adults will die prematurely just within a few hours of exposure to um, what is now the stream water mixed with water coming off of those hard surfaces. And we find that there's higher rates of this pre-spawning mortality happening where there are more roads and there's more traffic. So it's something in that complex mixture of chemicals coming off of our hard surfaces that's causing this pre-spawn mortality. As we see human population increase, that's going to increase the many different things that affect the salmon. It's going to lower their habitat. It's going to add probably pollution. We got to be careful of the creeks and streams that salmon do run in. We want to make sure that if there are culverts, they're not failed. Within our treaty of Point Elliot, 1855, Native Americans are entitled to half of the harvestable fish. And that's often misunderstood. It's not half of all the fish, it's half of the harvestable fish. And that number is set by biologists, PhDs, uh, a lot of different people working together to set that number within the state. 
it's been really great working with the Suquamish tribe in the research that we've done so far. And our larger research group has started to reach out to other tribes in the region and A, let them know what we're doing and what we're finding and the threat to coho salmon in particular, and also to have them aware of this ecological, essentially, disaster that occurs when we build up our environment too much. Um, or maybe it's just the way that we do it. So I think it's going to be important that the tribes are a part of the solution in terms of advocating for building our environment in different ways or finding ways to clean up the stormwater runoff before it enters the creeks. Every time it rains, we have the runoff coming off of the streets, parking lots, highways, rooftops, and it contains a, a toxic stew of chemicals that has actually been shown to kill salmon in very short order. Particularly coho salmon appear to be very sensitive to the stormwater pollution. Fir trees, maple trees, 100 years old, 200 years old, they can be cut down in 10 minutes. And will, will a tree of that nature ever grow again in that location to protect that stream? Not likely until people's values change. Is it tire particles? You know, do we need to reformulate what's, what tires are made of? Um, is it uh, making sure that nobody's car leaks or drips fluids onto the road? Is that going to be the most important part of that chemical mixture? So that's ongoing research that we do hope will help individual people make better decisions to help our environment. Essentially, the Northwest tribes uh, signed away uh, their land in order to have the right to keep, keep fishing. So we took the land and the fishing was so important to them, um, they made a deal with us. And so we have a, a responsibility to keep that deal. This problem that we're finding with the coho salmon really is everybody's problem. I think there's a, a lot that citizens can do to control the future in terms of, you know, talking with your elected officials and making sure they know what's important to you if you want to help solve the problem with um, survival of coho in our urban streams. Learn about what processes are taking place at the state level, the federal level, uh, even the local level, and stand up for clean water. There will be opportunities throughout the year uh, where a citizen's voice is really needed to say, yes, we need to protect our waters. It's the most important thing that we have. Tribes in the Pacific Northwest have banded together to produce documents and reports that even been, that have been brought to, to Congress in Washington, D.C. to try to paint the picture of what's happening to the salmon resource in the Pacific Northwest. And that message it's being heard by some, but it's not reaching the wide general public. Our efforts to protect Puget Sound and clean water really impact salmon, and salmon for the cultural history it has here, as well as for the rest of us that, that are here now. Um, it's part of our heritage and the heritage of Puget Sound. So hopefully by keeping toxic pollutants out one pipe at a time, one facility at a time, we're doing something good.